Welcome to Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined once again by Colin Watt who is sitting a socially distanced two metres away from me here uh, and everything's been cleaned down before you came into the studio, Colin, how are you doing? <laughs> socially distant and safe, Paul, socially distant and safe. Always safe and um, we're here to speak obviously about the big topics in Scottish football, um, all about Celtic. But, you know, straight away we've, we've had a, a very interesting comment from Barry McGlinchey and it is on the agenda today. So we will be talking about the uh, lack of supporters in fo- football grounds and mm-hmm. the impact that's going to have. That's definitely on the agenda, Barry. So we'll come back to that. Thanks for getting involved. Everybody who's out there watching, please get involved uh, via Twitter, YouTube and Facebook. We're going to kick off by talking about Thursday night's game. We're back in Europe. We're away from home. It's a one-off. Colin, tell me your thoughts about the game. That's the most concerning part, isn't it? It's the fact that it's a one-off game. Anything can happen and there is no second chance now. Um, when we get knocked out off uh, Fenech Varos, then we, we came into the Europa League and um, that's sort of like your second chance. But there is no third chance. There's uh, We have to go out and we have to go and win this game on Thursday night. So um, I'm expecting there will be changes from the side that played Livingston at the weekend. Um, I've, I've listened to you guys through the week talking about the rotation of the squad. And Thanks for tuning in. That's okay, someone's got to. Um, but listening to the rotation of the squad and um, not really having a settled 11. Um, and I think what you saw was on uh, Sunday when Hibs played Rangers. Mm-hmm. Rangers now have a sort of settled 11. Um, but with the amount of injuries they're carrying at the moment, when they're bringing players in, the players aren't of the same quality as the ones that they're, they're missing. So... Um, it is obviously affecting their performances and with the fact that we're kind of currently keep rotating and rotating and rotating then you kind of try to cut out that um, possibility of injury in the squad um, although I think there's <laughs> there's more to be said about the fact that we've not rested Brown over the last couple of weeks um, I think that's something you were calling for uh, last week against St Mirren we had a good discussion yeah. about that Colin I, I mentioned in the comments earlier on this week I think Scott Brown's a bit of a, a 60 minute man now um, when he gets to the 60 minute mark if you're a couple of goals up like we were on on uh, Saturday then mm. I would maybe look to bring him off and, and rest them. I think Lennon's came out himself and said that he will have to rest Scott Brown for certain games this season and that's only inevitable I mean the man's 35 years old he's had 18 years in Scottish football and the treatment that he gets and the lack of protection that he's had over the years um, it will wear on his body um, so if we do want him to be the one that drives us to 10 in a row we are going to need to rest them and there is players to come in like in Cham, Sorrow, Connell guys like that that, should, that are looking for game time even someone if you look at um, who we loaned out la- this week mm-hmm. Kerr McEnroy plays in that role, the Scott Brown role went to Dunfermline and scored two goals last night against Spartan so it's a good, it's a good place to play <laughs> so I've heard um, but rotation I expect to see probably three or four changes for from the side that played Livingston to play the side that plays Riga this week. Um, they struggled against a San Marino team mm. um, and their stadium has a bit of safety concern as well. So, be an interesting one. Let's see what um, what lies ahead. But just looking forward to seeing Celtic getting back on the park. Could be doing with some uplifting news recently, yeah? Yeah, well, we will be uh, talking. There's a lot of comments coming in. We'll go through as many as we can, Colin. But we will be talking about the lack of supporters in Scottish football grounds and the potential impact because it's going to be a bleak picture unless uh, the Scottish Government are able to put a package together because we will be facing clubs going out of business. Absolutely no shadow of a doubt about that. Oh, definitely. And this, this kind of hurts to say, and I'm sure I'm going to get slagged for this in the comments, but... Excuse me, sorry. I was watching the um, the announcements last night, and obviously Boris had his announcement, and then Nicola Sturgeon had hers. But there was a program on BBC just after it, um, which I only just realised that Martin Geisler is now part of the BBC Scotland team. He's a fantastic journalist, um, Martin. But they were discussing with uh, Douglas Ross about things like bringing in the furlough package scheme and stuff and Douglas Ross actually came across very well um, terrible linesman um, it's in Hatton. well it, it's strange do you know what I mean that people can talk common sense you, you look at the we all had um, nice words to say about Rishi Sunak when he brought out the, the package and now he's looking to scrap benefits so 
people can turn as easy as um, you take a, a kind of appreciative view of what they say, but I, I, we're not going to turn this into a politics podcast. We've already discussed the option of having that later down the line, uh, maybe when we get to the Scottish elections, but <laughs> you're right, it's a worrying time for a lot of people in Scottish football. There's not just players there's staff behind the scenes, you've got uh, the catering staff, you've got uh, security. Um, I feel as though, and I think you've said this before, Paul, if it is to be that there's not going to be fans in the grounds for six months, mm-hmm. then we won't have 42 professional teams come 2021. I know we're kind of jumped into this uh, as part of the agenda and, and we've gone from the European game to it but whilst we're speaking about it I, I would make comment on that uh, I, I think there was a lot of scaremongering uh, initially and a lot of people were living in fear Colin so everybody was thinking about the worst case scenario just in life day to day business um, but of also being football fans we, we were speaking and discussing uh, the implications to Scottish football and back then we were talking to some financial experts on, on the impact of the game uh, in Scotland and yeah, you know, I was c- kind of criticised for being a prophet of doom that's what I was mm-hmm. being called but and it's not an, I told you so I just you know it's as clear as day to me unless there is a, a support package in place by the Scottish Government the 42 clubs that you mentioned and loads of other clubs below that uh, you know in the, in the pyramid within Scotland and loads of to, you know youth development uh, academies and football clubs and boys clubs it all comes down to whether or not they can be funded and without fans through the doors, particularly for the professional clubs, then they are going to they're going to go out mm-hmm. of business. And and that you know that is a stark reality for the for big the larger clubs. But when you go down the leagues, there there are clubs there who are working week to week. In any case, under normal circumstances, with fans coming through the gates, and Barry McGlinchey's uh, comment that that was the first comment that was made uh, this morning. And thanks for getting involved, Barry. More worryingly for the Scottish game is that clubs will potentially fall due to COVID. This could have serious implications for the league continuing. Thoughts? You see, at the minute we've we've got with the Betfred Cup. If you're not, if you're playing a Premiership team, which there's a Premiership team in most of the groups, I think, um, then you have to get tested, and these clubs can't afford the testing that's out there at the moment. So, if they can't afford that then what hope have they got of not having fans in at the stadium for the next six months? Well, you know, what what normally happens, Colin, when we're on, obviously when we're on air for about an hour or so, other developments are taking place um, in the world around us and there's a suggestion here that uh, there's been a, an announcement that no football fans in grounds till March. Uh, if that is the case, you'll be basically now looking for a support package for Scottish football clubs. Now, this, I don't think... Um, we could be criticised for this being selfish because football isn't just a game. No. It's not a game. It's an earner for communities. It's an earner for the economy. We've spoken in detail about how big Celtic are to the economy uh, in relation to the um, the business that it attracts to the, the Glasgow area, uh, to businesses all around the park, uh, flights. Uh, you know, it filters down and down and down. And it's an, it's millions and millions of pounds for the economy outside of Celtic Football Club. Mm-hmm. There was a study done on Air United, for example, and it showed you the figures were astonishing for a club just like Air United. It would be the same for Dunfermline Athletic and the business that 5,000 people in Halbeth Road every fortnight brings to the wider economy within Dunfermline. And it's the same for all these community clubs throughout Scotland. So without the fans, yes, the clubs are struggling, but loads of other businesses outside, you know, in the in the kind of footfall area of Halbeth Road for Dunfermline or, or Kerrydale Street for Celtic. And the, these are the, the wider economic issues. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying that obviously the Scottish government will need to speak to, um, you know, Scottish football uh, bodies to ensure that the game survives, Colin. Because I'm not going to be selfish and say, oh, well, you know, Celtic can just move elsewhere and all this kind of stuff. And other leagues will have the same issues and we can all merge into one big league. You want the Scottish game to survive. And without a package in place, it's not going to survive. No, definitely. And um, my concern is, will they get the league started? Will they get the lower league started? Um, Will clubs be able to afford 
even running the games. I mean, we've spoke about benefactors and things like that. We had James Anderson, who ploughed a good substantial amount of money into Scottish football over the summer. We spoke uh, a couple of weeks ago about Mark Miller installing um, a new platform for uh, clubs to show their games on a, mm-hmm. an online website. Mm-hmm. There is going to need to be some sort of additional support given to clubs to survive this because the players have still got to be paid and there's no one there to, to fund the the wages. I mean, I think the recent study came out showed that Scottish football is um, the highest uh, of the ratio for um, people through the turnstile as opposed to the um, general overall income from the club. It's something like 60% mm. of... They rely heavily on, on punters through the door. Yeah, it's like 60% yeah. of their annual turnover is made through guys coming through, or girls coming through the turnstiles. So when it, when you look at something like that, if you've lost 60% of your playing budget for the year, that is going to have serious implications on what you can do as a club. Um, and it's, see, to be honest, it's not just football. All the other sports are out there as well. We're talking about our professional um, rugby teams, our professional ice hockey teams, our professional all these teams which have a fan base that cannot get to watch the club. And it's a it's a serious worrying time in Scottish sport. It's a worrying time, just generally. But you're absolutely right, Colin. And we will report as the news happens over the the coming days. Um, The Celtic State of Mind Bulletin has been extremely popular, Colin, none more so than yesterday when there was a ghoulish face appeared behind yourself in that that window and people actually thought it was a ghost. Uh, And it started getting spread around. You mean it's not? Uh, Well, who knows. But um, also, I need to point out, the, the banner up here is our sponsor. Yes. People are phoning the number thinking it's a phone in. So... Please be aware that that banner is our sponsor and they've been getting phone calls for people making points about James McLean. So, <laughs> cheers for that. It was all positive though. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and also, you know, going back to the, the the football side of things, what I didn't ask you, you, you were saying that you felt it was unlikely that we would go with the same team. I agree with you. How do you think we'll line up? What, what's your predicted 11 I for think, Thursday night? I think uh, Gillian will probably, if he's fit, will return back to the centre-half position. Um, they were talking about trying to get him in seems to be a sort of back strain or something um, if he's fit I would play him back uh, three back three Gillian mm-hmm. Ayer Duffy um, probably look at Frimpong playing as the right wing back mm. and uh, I'd probably play Forrest as the left wing back in there I know uh, Greg Taylor um, it, it's not that he doesn't put a foot wrong but I think when you're playing a one off game and you're looking for a more attacking lineup. I would have Forrest over um, over him. In the middle of the park, um, you're probably looking at having in Cham, McGregor. Brown's probably going to play, but if it was me, I wouldn't play him. I would probably either play Christie or Turnbull in that position, mm. just trying to, again, pull the team forward, drive forward. Um, and I would, just, if possible, I'd go with Edward and Ayeti up front. I think Ayeti's really coming on to a game and it was interesting to see Dixie Deans talking about Ayeti saying that he thinks he'll do very, very well for Celtic. Um, but he's also a fan of Klamala, so if someone that was such a prolific goal scorer like that sees something in someone, then I'll give him a bit more time. Dixie's a fan of Klamala. Big fan of Klamala, he says, yeah. We met him last season, Dixie. We were talking to him about Bob Marley being a Celtic fan. It was... It was a great day. Um, we'll run through some of the comments. So, in your opinion, no Christie starting? I can't see him starting, no. no. Interesting. Unless someone in the midfield drops out. Okay, and you mentioned the return for Edward, and that is the, the lead uh, headline. Will we keep him? There's obviously been further press speculation where the bold Chris Sutton says that he would tear up his season ticket if Celtic sell also on Edward. Um Personally... The partnership that you said you would pick for tomorrow night, Ayeti and Edward, it's got me excited. I think it's been a long time coming. The last time we had any sniff of a partnership was Edward and Dembele, yep. and it was split up before we could see it you know, building into what would have been a dream partnership. Definitely. Um, Edward more or less kind of carried that forward line himself for a long period of time. Mm-hmm. Griffiths came in uh, for reinforcements last season. Season was stopped, stop, start. So I'm finally looking at the Celtic team, Colin, and thinking, Ayeti and Eduard, what a partnership that could be. Are we about to lose that? I'm not so sure. Um, we're talking now, we're on the 23rd of September. The window closes 
on the 5th of October. So we've got roughly about 12 days, 13 days left of the window, something along them lines. Um, I'm not so sure that Celtic's valuation will be met, especially when you look at some of the deals that uh, the teams are doing down south. When you look at Liverpool over the last couple of days, signed Thiago for £20 million. Only £5 million of that's up front. Right. Um, they also signed Diego Yota from Wolves. £4 million of that up front. Now, we, we go on about Peter Lawwell being um, quite shrewd with his transfer movements. Always looking to sort of do that kind of deal up mm. front. Mm-hmm. But when someone's coming to take our players we tend to push for as much up front as possible and unless Aston Villa or whoever else that's out there is going to offer the kind of value that Celtic's looking for, I don't think it'll, it'll move and to be fair to Oddson, I don't think he's someone that will press for a move himself. No, I don't think so and some of the comments that are coming in and I will run through them um, are basically along the lines of, you know, he's shown via his agent he wants to stay for the 10 which is brilliant. We love to hear that as Celtic fans, Colin. But this ties in intrinsically to the other point that Barry McGlinchey made in relation to the COVID issues, right? Mm-hmm. And the reason it ties right into it is because Celtic as a football club will be looking at potential losses between now and March, if, if it is March, right? Yep. And they'll be looking at assets. And that, this is what concerns me. Because we've also heard that Ayer is interesting. AC Milan, he is one of many... Um, yes names on a, on a short list. I mean, Maldini didn't say we're going to buy him. He's a player who is interesting AC Milan. He's got a he's got a value. You know, people might argue if it's 14 or 15 or if it's closer to 20 to 25. He's got a value. But even that wouldn't f- fill the gap uh, yeah. between now and March, you know, in terms of lost revenue through the gate. And that's what concerns me. You know, there's got to be a business decision between now and when that transfer window slams shut from Celtic. And they might actually see Edward as being the key to that. And that worries me a I hell can, of a lot. I can see the, the point in that. Um, but what we've also got to look at is the market that's out there at the minute. I mean, I just mentioned there about Liverpool spending £9 million to bring in £60, £70 million worth of talent. Mm-hmm. I really can't see... Peter Lawwell accepting something as low as that. Look at how far on we pushed that Kieran Tierney deal to the point where it almost looked as if it wasn't going to happen if Arsenal couldn't pay the money up front. Mm -hmm. He's done very well in that sense. He's done it with Arsenal, with Tierney. He's done it with Leon, with Dembele. Um, He doesn't accept a lower amount up front. So unless someone like Aston Villa or whoever's linked with Edward is going to pay the 30 or 40 million that Celtic want up front, I really can't see him moving on this window. There is other players, as you mentioned, like Ayer. I'd probably throw in Cham, maybe Christie in there, who are attracting interest from mm. down south. Mm-hmm. Thinking Cham was linked with a move to West Brom for about 14, 15 million. I could see that happening more than I could see Edward moving on for the sort of money that Celtic's looking for anyway. What you do know is that whatever is done between now and the transfer window closing, um, it will be done with Celtic's business interests. At heart, that's one mm, thing. Yeah. You know, you could criticise those in charge at Celtic, but you know for a fact that you know the decisions that are made will be made with that in mind. Oh, it, won't, it won't be simply to outdo the opposition. You know, we won't be spending money we don't have. It will be all about whether or not we can plan ahead over the next few months without any fans in the stadium. Well, what will be interesting to me is Thursday night because Thursday night is a massive game in terms of potential revenue Mm -hmm. if you get through this then we've got a tie um, again in the playoffs I actually can't remember who we've drawn Um, you've got those two rounds to get through to Europa League which opens up additional revenue Mm -hmm. Um, it's not as great as the riches of the Champions League but it is revenue that can help fill in that gap we're talking about we're going to have to balance the books we're not the only team that's going to have to balance books. Not, I'm not just talking in England and Scotland, but across the, the globe, you look at the likes of how Barcelona are moving on some of their players. They're not moving for mega deals at the minute. So if Celtic's valuation of Edward continues to be the 30, 40 million that we're talking about, there's going to be very few and far between that can afford that sort of money. You've got interest in Ayer in Cham. And I'm guessing Eduard, I know he's been linked with Villa, he's been linked with Arsenal. Arsenal's uh, been mentioned in dispatches. 
Celtic will know the figure they need to survive through the lockdown, should it be a complete lockdown, Colin, mm-hmm. and they'll get that figure. So if that means selling a player for £30 million or selling two players for £15 million, they'll get that figure. Well, it's interesting we spoke about uh, Dermot Desmond's interview the other day. Dermot, obviously, is the money man at Celtic um, and has been known in previous occasions to sort of help out when things were specifically needed. When we look at things like the the, uh, Robbie Keane deal, um, when Brendan Rodgers came in, when Celtic really needed that investment, he sort of was there to, to help out. If he can maybe see the 10 in a row and the potential benefits of that and outweighing the fact that he might have to finance a season, maybe that's something else that we don't know that's going on in the background as well. Well, Colin, you know, we're going to report on it um, on a fact-by-fact daily basis. And, you know, what what I'm trying to say is we're in good hands in that respect, whereas there's other clubs who don't have these options. Definitely. There's, there's clubs out there who don't have options. There's clubs out there who have been flogging a dead horse for a long time and won't get anywhere near the money that they're, they're you know, aspiring to achieve. So it's a I bit think harsh on Scott McKenna. Well, Scott McKenna, we could talk about him. I think Charlie Nicholas has made a few points about uh, Scott McKenna and the fact that Celtic should still have signed them. But, you know, th- these are the things that I, I'm not going to say I'm confident. I mean, nobody knows the, the future under these stressful times, no. Colin, but we're in good hands in that respect. Sometimes it's frustrating as a Celtic fan under normal circumstances when we're penny pinching, as they call it. But. Yep. It, it does show under these circumstances that you are in good hands and safe hands and I'm pretty sure that the decisions will, will be made with that in mind. Yep. Loads of great comments coming through. Let's read through some of them before we get back on to the, the other points that we want to, to cover. And Kevin Selt via YouTube. I'm sorry to say I'm convinced Eddie is going. Based on just the last two weeks, it's obvious that there's something going on behind the scenes. No way he's tired or not fit. I'm sure he's going, sadly. Um... Now, what I wouldn't like to say straight away, Kevin, I can understand your point. I totally understand that. You, you've got to take Neil Lennon for his word, haven't you? So when he comes out and says, Lee Griffiths has got a calf strain, you've just got to trust that. Mm-hmm. If he comes out and says, you know, I've had a discussion with Edward, you've got to trust what, what Lennon's saying, don't you? Well, the thing is, Edward's had a couple of injuries here and there. Um, he looks as if he wasn't going to be... He was kicked all over the park at Tannadice. Yeah, looked, you know, he missed the game after that. He looked as, as if he wasn't going to play for the, the France under 21s, and mm-hmm. eventually I think Celtic relented and let him go. Yep. Um, and then he played something like two games in four days when he's still trying to get back to his fitness levels. Mm-hmm. So, Edward's a kind of player where if he turned to me as a manager and says, Look, Gaffer, I don't think I can give you 90 minutes today, he is my prized possession. I'm not going to throw him out there against, sorry for any Livingston fans watching, a team of stone chuckers. They, they, they are a big, heavy physical team. Stone chuckers? Yeah. Is that the same as hammer throwers? Something like that, yeah. I'm not going to put him out against that if he, to- he tells me he's not fit. Yeah. I'm going to protect my key asset. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Can you imagine if we turned around and Edward played on Saturday and we were actually trying to move him on and he, he breaks his leg? That's mm, it. You've mm-hmm. lost your valuable asset. Maybe there is something like that going on in the background. But for me, if Edward turns around and says to me, I'm not going to be able to give you the best 90 minutes if there's a place on the bench for him. Lennon said he was going to bring him on. But at 3-1 he thought the game was done. So if you can rest someone like that the same way we'd want to rest guys like Scott Brown... Do it. But that's the argument because we've been seeing time and time again about squad rotation, about resting certain players. Absolutely. It, you know, Edward's played a lot of football mm-hmm. uh, over the last couple of seasons. As I say, he was kind of carrying the, the forward line for long enough before Griffiths came in last season. And I think if you can get the opportunity to rest them against such clubs as Livingston, I mean, I thought we were going to win comfortably, far more comfortably than the scoreline suggested. Exactly, yep. And um, so that's a type of fixture that you can rest Edward in. Mm-hmm and still get the result. And also with one eye on the Europa League game and how important that is on Thursday night as well, as you quite rightly pointed out, Colin. But probably in the background also with the potential that you just never know about your greatest asset and whether or not we're going to have to cash in on them. 
uh, I would share Chris Sutton's frustrations. The the virtual season ticket will only be <laughs> getting torn up, but uh, I can understand what he's saying. Oh no, definitely. But and it goes back to a conversation that was had on this podcast. I think only a couple of days ago, when uh, yourself and Kevin spoke about guys that were coming in and the the kind of caliber we're bringing in now, mm. we're bringing in a five million international striker in a yeti. Yeah. So. Whereas before, when you said Edward had to lead the line, the reason Edward had to lead the line is because there wasn't really there someone that could come in and do the exact same job that he's doing at the minute. Yeah. So we we had Lee Griffiths when he was fit, we had Klamala coming through, we had Bio, but there wasn't one that you could turn to in a game against Livingston and say, go and score me a couple of goals. This way that you could probably now turn to Ayeti, um if Edward was ever out for a period of time and hope that he could lead the line for you. Absolutely. I'm keen to get through as many points as possible. This is a slightly earlier bulletin today, Colin, yep. and um, there's a reason for that that might become clear before the transfer window closes shut. Will you be with us on that night? We're going to do a to special be. evening edition. Well, you told me you were going to send me to Lennox Town. I don't know if the new restrictions uh, will will stop that from happening, but I think this will be a... We're going to do a live stream for most Absolutely. of the night. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we'll get our yellow ties digged out for that one. Aye. Perhaps. Um, <laughs> via Facebook, Eduard's agent said 10 in a row was important to him. Neil Lennon said no bids. We will hold on to him until May. I hope you're right. I really do. Uh, Lawrence Z. Reed via Twitter. We have to. He's our best. He's a, he's, he's a star man. I totally agree with yep. you. He absolutely is the, the star man. And I think that, um, you know, if we were to lose him, it would be, it would be so disappointing. But I don't think it would be a football style decision I think it will be a decision based on the announcement yesterday and how that's going to affect the club's finances well the thing for me again and it's something I brought up yesterday is if we let him go we still need a replacement because I, I wouldn't be comfortable going into the season with just a Yeti Klamala and Griffiths um, Griffiths we, we all hope he gets back to his best but we don't know when that's going to be Klamala I don't think I've shared the same optimism as Dixie Deans. I don't think he'll ever be the guy that's going to score you 20 goals a season. Mm. Um, and then once again, we'd be relying on Ayeti, the same way we've relied on Edward for the last couple of seasons. You want to leave the transfer window stronger than how you entered it. Um, and if we don't sign a replacement for Edward if he was to move, then we haven't done that. Same way if we don't sign a replacement for Ayer if he moves, we've not done that either. Okay. And that takes us on to the Charlie Nicholas point. Uh, before I, I come to that, Davey on YouTube, time for players to nail their colours to the mast. Look at what a bit of criticism done for Christie. Uh, clone Henrik Larson. I wish we could. Uh, we've got some match one jerseys out there. We can maybe be able to extract some sweat from it, and I'm not sure what you can do with that. Um, so, what we've got is we've got Charlie Nicholas saying that we should have signed Scott McKenna. Um, agree? Disagree? No. He's a stone chucker or a hammer thrower or however you want to put it across. Um, honestly, I've, I've watched Hearts and I've watched them play for Scotland and I don't see Aberdeen. what everyone... Sorry, yes, for Aberdeen and mm. for Scotland. I don't see what anybody sees in him. I really don't see it. I mean, I think we're we're almost verging on the same um, sort of territory as what we did when we signed Jack Henry. I don't think I could see... Jack and Bill. <sighs> Is it got to be that because Scotland struggle for a position, when someone shows any sort of potential, then immediately it's the next big thing? i seen a lot of comments yesterday about signing Ryan Porteous. Ryan Porteous is not a great defender and he's nowhere near good enough to come in and play for Celtic. Is that simply based on the fact that he wound up various Rangers players? I'd say that is exactly what it is. Seriously? I don't... See these people that come in and say, sign this guy, sign this guy. You have to take it in and look at the squad we've got mm -hmm. and ask, are they any better than the player that you're coming in? We, we're talking about signing Ryan Porteous to replace Christopher Ayer. Now, OK, Hibs have had a great start of the season. They've conceded only five goals, which I think is roughly about the same as Celtic. Um, and only two of them have came from open play. But... Is he going to be able to go up and play against Riga on Thursday night? Is he going to, when we get into the, hopefully get into the group stage and we come up against teams like Lazio, would you want to go into a game against Lazio with Ryan Porteous as your centre half? I, I really don't see it. We, we're looking, and I get the attachment to a Scottish player coming through and showing a bit of grit and being a, a Celtic fan or a anti Rangers fan, 
But let's be realistic here. Let's look at players that are actually going to improve the squad. No, you're right. And, and again, I think that was the point I made when we were talking about the, it being a, a particularly good transfer window for Celtic was the players that were coming in were first team players who were improving mm-hmm. the squad. And if they weren't walking straight into the, the team like Barkas, then they were certainly pushing for a jersey. Exactly, yep. Um, and I think that's the difference between this transfer window, you know, against some of the other ones where players were coming in and you actually weren't expecting to see them for six or seven months. We're still really waiting to see Sorrow. And mm-hmm. he signed him in January. I mean, there's, there's certain positions where Celtic as a squad need to develop. But centre-half, if you're going to bring someone in, the likelihood is you're subbing one out and one in mm-hmm. because you're playing three five two, and the guys that you've got coming in as backup like Beaton and El Hamid, it's not their natural position, so that is the reason why they are the backup. You're wanting the three to go in there in the same ilk that we had Bobo Baldi, Josfo Haran, and Johan Mialbi. That was your back three, and that's what we're trying to recreate. I think this season in Ayer, Julian, and Duffy, you've got the 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 three centre halves there. If I, I'd rather have Ayer, no matter how much he wants to leave, Duffy and Julian, than Poteus, McKenna and Duffy. Can you imagine that back three? It's such a downgrade for me. I know. Sounds like a Gordon Strachan back three. It does. Uh, <laughs> Stephen Mullen, if Celtic are looking for 40 million quid, then I think Eduard will be a Celtic player after the window. Good point. I'd agree. Especially yep. if they're looking for 40 million up front. Yeah. Um, you know, that that is an interesting point. Kevin Graham, another one of our uh, regular contributors. Lennon has said Brown will be rested. Rotation will be the normal in this season that is anything but normal. Absolutely. We've got five tournaments. I keep saying this. We've got five trophies to play for. And uh, Kevin goes on to say that that's him and Colin finished. I'm not sure what you've said to upset him today, Colin. Uh oh. Gary Doonan. Yeah, can't see why not. Who knows? Maybe a jetty overtakes him between now and January. Who knows, maybe if Griffiths gets back in and has an Indian summer. Um, I think it'll all come down to the pandemic. Yeah, definitely. I mean, finances, they're, they're talking about how Premier League clubs could lose um, up to £100 million a month uh, but across the board because of not having fans across the gate. We go back to this thing about the TV deals last year, how the Premier League down south ended up paying Sky a lot of money because there was no fans at the games. Mm -hmm. So is that another thing that's going to be happening? Is the TV contracts, which English football relies upon heavily for a lot of their income, are they going to be compromised in any sort of way? I know all the games now are being shown um, through September and October live on TV. There was even a game on the BBC the other night, but but who knows? Um, Going back to another point, I think Kevin just made it there about the rotation. Um... It reminds me of when Liverpool were sort of going through that spell um, and they had like Torres and um, Garcia and players like that mm-hmm. and they were all competing. They, they qualified basically from the first qualification round of the Champions League right through at the final. They are playing in the, the league, the League Cup, etc. And there was a lot of rotation there and eventually that was what came back to sort of bite them when they were going for the, the title down south. Um, uh, the manager's totally slipped my radar you know the the Spanish manager looks like Al from Al's Toy Barn and Toy Story <laughs> I know that I know Al's Toy Barn, uh, Barn quite well I watched that film quite a bit he's oh I'm trying to think of the manager's name that's a terrible see, that, see what's wrong at the moment Colin is people are over reliant on just checking their phones so come on get through that and come back to us <laughs> when you've got an answer alright because I'm not googling it for but you rotation it's going to be key, mm-hmm. but the key thing there and the difference in what we can learn from that is not to over-rotate to the point where um, things like you want a settled back three, mm-hmm. you want a set- settled partnership up front. There'll be certain positions that are interchangeable, um, like Browns, but if we tinker with it too much, it could have a, a bit of a dramatic effect for us. Kevin Graham's on form today. He's uh, obviously working for home. Um, and he says via YouTube, Celtic are in trouble now as well. I think everybody needs to realise, no matter how big your club is, and Celtic are the biggest club in Scotland, um, yeah, they are going to have to look at financially how to get through the next six months. You've got the name? Rafa Benitez. Right. There it goes. Could have been a Celtic manager at some point, Rafa Benitez. I think he would have been a great Celtic manager. Definitely. Um, although I did like the meme 
that went out there when we all thought it was Rafa Benitez and it was Neil Lennon and it was uh, they basically kind of done him up to be Rafa Benitez it was quite funny I know but uh, you know I wouldn't compare him to that guy out of Toy Story because he was a bit <laughs> creepy Celtic are in trouble now as well Kevin says we have probably gone from selling one big name to selling two rumours of £10 million bids for defenders seem utterly without merit I think what you mean, Kevin, is rumours that Celtic are bidding ten million for, for like Omar Colley Colley, and yeah. players like that. I'd agree with that. Aye. That that's not going to happen. No. Um, but as I say, Celtic as a business will look at how much money we need between now and let's say March, and if it means selling two guys like uh, in Cham and Ayer, then it will happen. For me, I've I've harped on and on and on about this. We can have six loan players this season. And I think as we get closer and closer to the window closing mm. and players down south are looking to get themselves involved in the Euro 2021 squads, as clubs down south are looking to try and get players off their wage budget, mm -hmm. then I feel like these deals will open up to Celtic. And if we do move on, someone like Ayer or um, in Cham, maybe we replace them with guys like Benkovic at Leicester, who was nowhere near their start. Remember squad. him? Um, and other players of that ilk may become available. They will need to, obviously, as you say, adapt to the situation, Colin, won't they? Um, Football Prime Ginger. What a name. Mm, welcome to the show. You two should do a watch along for the Riga versus Celtic game. Really enjoy these podcasts. Keep it up. We were doing full watch alongs, and it was a two and a half hour to three hour experience I think you would call it um, for four games we were doing that so we've been splitting them up into pre-match half-time post-match and we'll see how it goes the, the big issue we had actually watching the games was a time lag mm -hmm. so we were watching it apparently live in the studio but people were texting us and people were actually commenting quicker than it was happening on our screen so yes we will try and get round that and until we get round that time lag Unfortunately, we'll need to just go for the pre-match, half-time and post-match. Yeah, and there's some clever people out there that can edit 30 seconds into a two and a half hour broadcast. So we'll, we'll play it safe at the minute. Same way we're playing safe with the phone in. Uh, until we've got it ready to go, I don't think we'll, we'll quite verge into that yet. It goes back to when we used to do a live gigs call and I would never put the mic into the crowd and I'm of the same opinion when it comes to the <laughs> phone in, to be totally honest with you. Um, some of the points that uh, also... I was going to cover yesterday was about Fraser Foster. You're talking about the loan mm. market. And uh, obviously, the grass is not always greener. I think Fraser Foster's situation has shown that, hasn't it? No, and I, I, said, I mentioned that in the comments last week. I think Fraser Foster will now look at what's happened and maybe regret his decision. Do you know what? People have got to make these decisions almost on the, the snap, on the fly. Um, a lot of people saying last week as well, don't bring back Roberts, he turned us down. No, look, guys are going to go out and make mistakes in their career. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure Gary Hooper regrets leaving Celtic, probably Joe Ledley as well. Um, guys that thought that it was their time to move on. Look, football's a, a short career. That's what we keep getting told when we talk about the Kieran Tierney move and how personally I think he moved too early, but everyone out there saying it's a short career, he's got to make his money. These other players have got to make their money as well, but... They never left us on bad terms. If the door's open for people like that to come back, then I would certainly welcome them. And again, I've already been told to stop talking about Roderick and Griffiths, but under the circumstances, and we are entering dark old days, dark times again, Colin, um, you're going to need all your your top players mm -hmm. available. And Roderick and Griffiths have it in them to be first team contenders and I think that's why I keep banging on about them because at the moment they're two empty jerseys and I think they both need to step up to the mark and become part of the first team squad It was good to see Rodgick back in the subs bench yeah. certainly at the weekend um, and I think there will be games for Rodgick to get his fitness up between now and the, the break which is actually only what two weeks away now um, hopefully he gets a, a couple of run outs here and there uh, I don't think he's going to be playing for Australia over the next couple of weeks so I hope he doesn't make that, that trip I hope he stays at home and maybe when we come back from the international break we'll see Lee Griffiths finally over his, his calf injury He's niggling calf injury, yes and that that's what it basically comes down to I just think you've got two empty jerseys at the moment with a two guys start contributing start mm. contributing to the cause and the cause is five tournaments um, Celtic fans would love to be there in person so be there as a player, you know 
Well, we've got the Scottish Cup coming up next month, mm-hmm. which was put off for the fact that they wanted to get fans back. That's not going to happen anymore. So we've got a semi-final to look forward to next month. Um, as you say, let's try and win everything that we can. We, as a Celtic player, I want their mentality to be that they go into every game thinking that they can win. Um, so let's keep everybody on their toes. Let's keep the squad as... As, as fresh as possible and guys like having Roderick and Griffiths back in will give players a bit of a boost and it will maybe push for competition in other places Well, if Roderick starts to you know, play and contribute if we have to sell someone like in Cham or Christie and I say if we have to mm-hmm. and that sounds like a wee bit dramatic but it might be the case Colin depending on what happens over the next few months then you've got a player there who at least is going to be contributing to the first team. We get a lot of comments on this uh, podcast, on this broadcast rather, in relation to Luca Connell. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we don't often mention him, to be fair, because he hasn't played much in, in the first team. I yeah. think he was he was bought with first team experience that he had gained at Bolton. And I think the first time I seen him was against Wren in the, the friendly yes. game. I'm sure he played, yep. played pretty well, mm-hmm. if I remember right. But his appearances have been fleeting um, and people are saying, well, surely he's an option. Listen, we're going to have to maximise your squad, potentially. You know, it may well be that we don't bring anybody in. Yeah, I'd love to bring in a left back. It's obvious we need another left back or left-sided player. I'd love to see Paddy Roberts coming in. You know, there's been talk about James McLean, not for me, personally. Uh, There'll be other players. We've been linked to so many players like Ben Davies and... uh, Will we bring anybody in? Does yesterday's announcement change things? Absolutely. Of course it does. Yeah. I mean, it, it, anything like that is going to have a, a knock-on effect. Although you don't see it up front, it's what goes on behind the scenes and what we were budgeting for and what we were expecting to happen. Um, Stephen Robinson actually came out and says that he doesn't want his players to get used to having to play without any fans. And I totally understand that. It was... It's not something that I want to even contemplate of not getting into a ground this season because um, it's quite a, a sad thought um, that something that you've been doing all your life is, is out there and people say, oh, do you know, there's a pandemic going on and uh, there's more important things. No, we get that, right? But when you take something which is part of someone's... It's almost part of someone's DNA is just to, to go to the games as, as frequently as you can. Um it is going to have an effect on them. Uh, <laughs> you look at someone like Paul the Tim, he would be away watching this game tomorrow night. Mm-hmm. He that is his that's his life. His life is Celtic, and for him, I, I can't imagine what it's like. Um, and there are many more. There. there are many more like Paul. Oh, definitely, you know? and, definitely. And I just think, yeah, you you definitely do have that element, Colin, of wanting to do something that's been part of your life for so long. But you also have the element of people's jobs yep. uh, and the wider economy who benefit from crowds at football games. Not just the big clubs. You know, I, I used Air United as an example. There's a great report on the SFA's website about how much within the economy Air United bring yeah. uh, you know, to the table. So all of these clubs bring a huge amount, even if their average attendances are in the, you know, Thousands in terms of four or five thousand, they're still bringing a lot to the economies around about them, and that that's the saddest thing about it. Every single club will be staring at that information today and looking at how they can survive, yeah. Celtic included. And I'm confident I'll, I'll criticise the club when necessary. I'll criticise Neil Lennon, and you know that you've got to do that. Otherwise, you know you're, you'd be as well being employed by the club. And I am confident that the people in charge of Celtic will make the right decisions for the club to ensure that we come out of this. No, I, I agree with you. Um, as much as we do lament the the transfer strategy from time to time and um, we see things like uh, deals that we thought were, were going to be goers, guys like Christian Pessini, guys like um, John McGinn, players like that where you're thinking, this is this is it, we're, we're ready, we're going to get them, this is it, and something falls through at the last minute. I have no doubt in my mind that the board at Celtic definitely where as much we think they're sort of stingy and hold back, they do have the club's best interest at heart, a hundred percent. Of course they do. Um and 
I don't think that they'll ever get to a stage where we're um, living out with our means, unlike some other clubs. Colin, it's always been a pleasure to have you here at the studio. You'll be doing it again very, very shortly. We've gone early today, half past 11, quarter to 12, because we had to, because I need to go on the road, because there's something happening in the world of Axom that I can't announce at the moment. So thank you, everybody, for getting involved via YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. And the last thing for me to say today is thank you very much, Colin Watt, for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. Hey, well. 